Support for LAist comes from the Emmy-nominated Apple original film, Still, a Michael J. Fox movie nominated for seven Emmy Awards, including Outstanding Documentary Film or Nonfiction Special. Following this podcast, you can hear Academy Award-winning and Emmy-nominated director Davis Guggenheim take you behind the scenes of this remarkable film. Rated R, streaming on Apple TV+. Plus. More at fyc.appletvplus.com. Author and humorist David Sedaris returns to the Soraya this November with a collection of new revelations. Spend an afternoon with David Sedaris as the master of satire tackles subjects ranging from adult braces to America's post-pandemic attempt at normalcy. Tickets at thesoraya.org. Studios. Hey y'all, this is Brian De Los Santos, and today we're bringing you a special episode from a live taping of On Point with Meghna Chakrabarty. Last week, the On Point team was here at our very own Crawford Family Forum to host a live event celebrating 50 years of hip hop. Stay tuned to hear the special episode. We hope you enjoy it. This is On Point. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. On August 11, 1973, Cindy Campbell threw a back-to-school party. She asked her older brother Clive to provide the music. They set up in a rec room of a Bronx apartment block. 18-year-old Clive was better known as DJ Cool Herc. Herc stood behind a pair of turntables and a mixer. He spun top hits from Aretha Franklin and James Brown, but he moved between records in a way that mixed one percussive break right into another, removing the lyrics and chorus. And with that, hip-hop was born. <laughs> Rapping, dancing, and DJing gave voice to a new generation of political consciousness in the Black community. It courted controversy and backlash. And now, hip-hop culture is so dominant in American culture, it's hard to remember a time before the beat was king. So today, on hip-hop's 50th anniversary, we're going to bring you a special conversation focusing on the influence of West Coast hip-hop. Tyree Boyd-Pates is an historian of Black culture and associate curator at the Autry Museum of the American West. Demita Jo Freeman is a groundbreaking dancer who began her career in 1973 on the legendary television show Soul Train. She helped popularize locking, one of hip-hop's signature dance styles. We partnered with LAist, public radio for Southern California, and our conversation took place before an audience at the Crawford, LAist's live event venue in Pasadena. And I began by asking Tyree Boyd-Pates to define the most important aspects of hip-hop culture. So there's five points of hip-hop. Locking is b-boying. Yes. MCing, DJing, graffiti. And then the last one, of course, KRS-One would kill me if I didn't say this, <laughs> is knowledge. <laughs> and those five elements comprise of hip-hop culture. Mm -hmm. And the emphasis on knowledge is probably the most key because for black youth, especially out of the 70s and the 80s, when they're coming into their own after the civil rights movement and the black power movement, knowledge of self is the most critical aspect mm -hmm. to why you b-boy, to why you rap, to why you DJ. Yes. Mm, okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's I mean, deep, y'all. It's deep. <laughs> it, no, well, and that's exactly right. Someone asked me why a while ago why I was so excited to do this, <laughs> this event tonight. And my automatic first answer is that hip-hop is the American story. Absolutely. Yes, it right? is. It, I would say it's one of the most important American stories of the 20th century. Easily. And it's a time when everything was changing. Wow. Yeah. And dancing was changing. Music was changing. Wow. Like it all happened at once. Yeah. This event is pegged to the 50th anniversary of hip-hop. The anniversary data is coming out in New York, right? <laughs> um, by the way, I think someone told me that there's some folks, or maybe at least one kind of important person in this audience who's really serious about New York hip hop. He might also be uh, the head of the LAist. Is he? <laughs> 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 no, I don't want to make a thing out of this, but. East Coast, West Coast, <laughs> yes. which one is better? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> we ready to fight. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh. We, 
We do a locking battle in the middle yes. of the room. <laughs> Put some breaking, right. some whacking. <laughs> but I keep raising the fact that popularly we're acknowledging East Coast. Mm-hmm. But I was trying to think back about, you know, how could we define the beginning of mm-hmm. hip hop in the West Coast? Mm-hmm. And one thing came up. Tyree, I want you to tell me what you think about this. Mm-hmm. This is from a, a, another historian who said, the thing that helped give rise to hip hop in the West were the Watts riots in 1965, okay? Because in 1967, a man named Bud Schulberg founded a creative space titled the Watts Writers Workshop Mm -hmm. and that was supposed to help folks from the neighborhood Mm -hmm. have a place where they could express themselves. Mm -hmm. What do you you think about that? I mean, that's completely true. Um, You have the last prophets who come out of Watts. You have... See? (laughs) (laughs) Hold it down for me. I love it over there. (laughs) Support me. Oh, and also it's really beautiful because in hip hop, the call and response, we're a call and response culture. So if you love us, are you like what we say? Talk back to us. This is, this is a part of the culture. Hello. Hello. You see, you see, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. Holler, holler. Holler, holler. But, but call and response is really important. But the last prophets out of Watts. Yes. And we can't forget that because there's a group of people who have been historically suppressed Mm-hmm. The best form of expression is creative it, expression. That's true. And so when you can't use your hands, you use your mouth. And when you can't use, use your, your mouth, mouth, you use your body. body. And that's the beauty of hip hop. And so you have to give credit to Parliament Funkadelic and what they made because most of their records ended up getting sampled by Dr. Dre <laughs> and all of the other um, um, MCs and rappers because that's, that's who they grew up listening to. Right. And so true. there's revolution in who they're sampling. And, and I think... That's what makes West Coast hip hop so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so tell me more than both of you. How would you describe the things that distinguish West Coast hip hop from East Coast? What do you think? Well, to me, West Coast hip hopping in the beginning for me, I'm a a locker. But to see the how it changes into hip hop. And see, to me, hip hop is really a name era. You, if you hear on TV, they'll say, oh, this is the bandstand days. The 60s were the rock and roll years. But now when they're saying 70s and on up, that was the hip hop era. It's like an umbrella. And under the umbrella is locking, is popping, mm-hmm. it's breaking. It's all of the style of dancing that the young people today are doing. Yeah. And, and what makes it West Coast, I got to give a shout out to the World Class Wrecking Crew because that's what Dr. Yeah. Dre was <laughs> of a part of. And he, 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 <laughs> thank you. Um, you got to give a shout out to lowrider culture. That's right. That's distinctly West, West Coast, Coast hip hop. Yes. Am I missing something? Tell me, what do y'all think? What else makes something West Coast, if you don't mind? G-Funk. 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 Yes. Egyptian Lover. Yes. Dickies. <laughs> Dickies, Converse, Cortez. What else? What, what? Hollywood. 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 That's right. Yeah, and Central Avenue. Le Merc. Le Merc. <laughs> and hold on, hold on. Hey, and I would be remiss. Yeah. And I would be remiss because what makes LA's an epicenter for hip hop has to be mentioned about Le Merc Park mm-hmm. featuring Project Blowed. Yes. And the Freestyle Fellowship and all of those great <laughs> artists. <laughs> that, that's, those are good things. Yes. <laughs> those are good things. That, that means we're hitting the notes. And Freestyle Fellowship and MERS and all of these rappers that came out from just miles down the street end up changing the face of a genre yeah. that, yes. that's world renowned. Oh, by the way, okay, I have to just tell you, I was telling Demita this earlier. So I hadn't seen a ton of Soul Train <laughs> growing up, but I was watching a bunch of videos of her dancing, and there was one that I just watched. Over and over <laughs> and over again. Because A, you're like a comet lighting up the stage. And B, the man standing behind her is James Brown. <laughs> okay? And get this, the godfather of soul standing behind Demita Joe. And he's looking her, looking at her up and down. You can Google this. You'll find it in a second. Looking at her up and down. And he looks like, he's like, I do not know what to do. I will not be able to keep up with her. He didn't. And I didn't know what I was doing either because I never heard that song before. This was the very first time that everybody the world was going to hear super bad. <laughs> and so when I went up on the stairs when he when we started, it was like, okay, 
keep going. <laughs> he loves to play that beat. Okay, keep going. So in my head, I'm looking, I'm smiling. I have no idea what's coming out of his mouth. <laughs> and when his mouth came and when the, you could feel the music when it drops. So therefore, I said, oh, change. <laughs> and I start dancing. And I've just kept going. And his smile and I said, oh, Lord, I'm in trouble. I'm doing something. I don't know what I'm doing. But I just threw in the robot, and I threw in so many different things. I mean, it's a, it's a work of art that yeah. you're doing there. I'm telling you. It was. Well, you know, here, and here's the power of it, because it, it relates to what you were saying. Even all these years later, mm-hmm. watching that little clip, as a viewer, you, you feel it. You still feel it yes. in your own bodies. That's what you were able to do across decades. Yes. Now, I'm also wondering about the impact that the rise, spread, the development of hip-hop music, dance, and culture had on the very neighborhoods Mm -hmm. here that were giving birth to it. So it was, to me, hip-hop is a communication. Dancing was communication. So therefore, by being accepted also helped. That's part of hip-hop. Because young kids want to be accepted. Artists were paying attention to us. We're just kids off the street. But now you're on a TV show, which there wasn't any black. There was American Bandstand. That's four black people on the show. <laughs> you know, chocolate women just moving. <laughs> so, but no, Soul Train was a group of people, young kids who wanted to actually shout out, yeah. I'm alive. Yeah. I can be a part of this world. Mm. Hip hop opened it up because it wasn't just dance. Mm. It was everything. Yeah. yeah. Speaking about the regional elements of hip hop, particularly the neighborhoods, you got to give a shout out to Compton itself. Totally. Yes. Um, yeah. And yes. shout out to Compton. What Kendrick Lamar has been able to symbolize mm-hmm. to Compton Mm-hmm. As a Pulitzer Prize winning artist, mm-hmm. nobody in Compton ever thought they would bring a Pulitzer back to Compton, right? But that's how important Compton is to this conversation. Mm-hmm. And I was listening to some interviews from Ice T, and he was alluding to how gangster rap out of the 1990s, so you think of the chronic, you think, you think Ice T, you think NWA, what hip hop was in the 90s, specifically for South Central, was just journalism. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, and ju- it was journalism, but it was taking the microphone and showing the world, world. how much you were ignoring Black America. Mm-hmm. And if you ignore us, then we're going to show you some attitude. <laughs> um, you know, straight out of Compton was the new message for the 1990s. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the world hasn't recovered since. And then don't even get me started about Snoop Dogg and what he's done for <laughs> Long Beach. <laughs> And he arguably is one of the people who's put Long Beach on the map. Mm-hmm. He will tell you this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was so attractive. It's so attractive that Tupac Shakur himself <laughs> was banging the West Coast more than people who actually were born here. <laughs> um, in the sense that Tupac was representing um, L.A. in particular yeah. because of the journalistic elements that his, um, the pioneers were making, too. We'll have more in a minute. This is On Point. Master of Satire David Sedaris returns to the Soraya this November with a collection of new revelations guaranteed to make you laugh. Spend an afternoon with the best-selling author and humorist, Sunday, November 19th. This gab session with Sedaris is sure to open your mind, make you laugh, and keep you smiling in your seats. Single tickets are on sale now and going fast. Learn more at thesoraya.org. I'm Jacqueline Stewart, host of the Academy Museum podcast. This season, we're talking about casting. And in our first episode, we'll be diving into the drama behind the scenes of casting the Alfred Hitchcock 1940 classic, Rebecca, and answering the question, how did casting work before casting director was even a job? We'll hear from film historian Patricia White about Rebecca's legacy and how tensions on set led to life imitating art. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. 
You're back with On Point. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. And now more of our special conversation on the influence of West Coast hip hop that we're offering you today on the 50th anniversary of hip hop culture. My guests were historian Tyree Boyd Pates and legendary dancer Demita Jo Freeman. We spoke before a packed audience at the Crawford, LA's live events venue in Pasadena, California. Hip hop has become one of the most powerful American cultural exports that spread around the world. So I wanted to know more about how Tyree and Demita Joe would describe hip hop's global impact. Here's Tyree. When I think about hip hop's impact on the world, I think about how you could literally put revolution in one person's body mm. and have them move so contagiously that the world wants to know how they did that. Yeah. Yes. And to know that, like, Hip hop started in the streets, mm -hmm. in the Bronx, but had impact. <laughs> okay, Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> um, from the Bronx all the way to have an impact on Los Angeles and then spread yeah. like the best cold you could ever catch. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, clearly, I caught it. No, um, <laughs> but it's something that reminds me as a historian that we're living in the history right now. That's mm -hmm. right. And to watch. A black musical genre take over the world is makes my gives me goosebumps. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, so Demita just said about how seeing your kids, seeing you, seeing yes. your story on stage, hearing it in the music, how powerful mm -hmm. that is and was. So, uh, picking up on that thought, mm -hmm. Tyree, I just want to quickly hear from you. Tell me a little bit about how you experienced it and what it meant to you as a young boy. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm from L.A., born and raised. I feel like I'm the last person who can say <laughs> that. Uh, but, but, like, shout out to the Angelinos who are listening and watching and, and stuff like that. But I grew up as a black kid in Koreatown. Mm -hmm. And, like, being a black kid in Koreatown in the 90s, directly after the L.A. riots, was definitely a time. <laughs> and the beauty of it was that what was innovating in South Central, particularly when it comes to music, was spreading to K-Town. Mm -hmm. And I saw... Black, brown, and Asian people taking a hold of the genre and making it their own in Koreatown. You have all of these people, um, our Asian brothers and sisters, who in K-Town and, and surrounding areas were able to innovate a genre, but also give homage to how yeah. black and beautiful it was. Mm -hmm. I love that. And that's what makes me me. And so I touched a turntable in Griffith Park at like a, a barbecue. And it was DJ Kidwick who like showed me the turntable, but my uncle used to play Tribe Called Quest yeah. over and yeah. over <laughs> and over again in our bedroom where we lived together. And that has stuck in my DNA ever since. And um, she hasn't broken up with me yet. <laughs> <laughs> Neither have I her. So. But, you know, it's easy to, at the 50 year mark, to look back on things with kind of right. rose colored glasses. Hello. But Because, you know, when you're talking about Straight Outta Compton, it changed everything, yeah. but there was backlash, this huge was. backlash. This was. So I want you guys to talk about that for a little bit, you know, because we're celebrating hip hop, but we also have to be mindful yes. that it's been a journey. It's been a fight. It's been you're still pushing against the same forces That's that right. wanted to ignore your stories to begin with. Yes. I'm listening to when you were saying it pushing, the word pushing in my head. That's what we did. <laughs> So in the beginning, hip hop was a slow process. Mm -hmm. First, we have to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. We just wanted to be heard. So therefore, hip hop, to me, it grew into a positive mm -hmm. yeah. to, uh, for everybody. Mm -hmm. Because now everybody has that opportunity to strive. And it's going to be hard all the way. It was always hard mm -hmm. because it took people who have visions that they could do it. And then there are people who have visions, no, they can't, mm -hmm. and want to keep us down. Mm -hmm. But we kept striving, and, it, and we lived off the music of yeah. if all these artists. I mean, now when they came out of the jail, you know, being, saying their whole thing, nobody paid attention to them. And so they now are something special too. Yeah. The word hip hop, to me, I always thought 
No, hip hop is like a bunny, nice thing. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, street dance, they didn't really want to say street dance. It sounds hard. It sounds black. Let's find another word. And, and a group to me saying a hip hop, a hip, 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 hip. hip. Don't yeah. stop the knocking to the bang, bang, book it. Hip. So it was cute. Yeah. Always striving to make, uh, instead of a, whatever color you are, your genre mm-hmm. or your the words that they put out has to be likable mm-hmm. mm-hmm. in order to be acceptable. So, but this is a thing that I think the gift that West Coast hip hop mm-hmm. gave the world. I completely agree with you and see what you're saying. Mm-hmm. And then we have groups coming out of the West Coast who are like, I don't care if you like me. That's right. Right? right? That's right. Yeah. Because yeah. it evolves. Yeah, right. exactly. Hip hop evolves. It gives us the right to say, I don't care. That's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that rebellious spirit leads me to say that it was initially a counterculture. Like, even LL Cool J will tell you this back in the day. No one ever actually thought hip hop was going to go this, this far. This far, right. Mm-hmm. Like, it wasn't expected to catch on. And the, the early adopters of hip hop were okay with that because mm-hmm. it wasn't mainstream. Mm-hmm. But as I think about the, the developments and the ways in which, uh, you know, uh, West Coast hip hop has made a name for itself, especially in the 90s, I'd be remiss to like not include how, how important women were into yes. this conversation. Yes. So J.J. Fad and Supersonic, Lady Rage, mm-hmm. Yo-Yo. Yes. W- whether hip hop wants to give credit to women, black women especially, exclusively, it's on the shoulders and backs of black women that, who were the first dancers <laughs> of all the beats. <laughs> And actually gave the men the validation that their songs actually could catch could on. Uh-huh. That's right. It did. You Hello? also you also say that that uh, the on both coasts, the by the black way. women um, were making hip hop that you say was more inspiring thematically. You know, I, I'm a historian, so I, I look at cycles. Yeah. So it's not surprising to me that black women rappers are dominating the genre currently. <laughs> <laughs> Because there was a period of time when Queen Latifah had a few people running for the hills. Oh, that's right. <laughs> and my man agrees with me. She did. You know, um, it, it's, I look at the cycles. Yeah. And so yes. um, whether it's the Meg The Stallions and then the names of this era who are taking and using their agency to show that their lyrics are more than what they look on the paper. Like, mm-hmm. I, I love it. Yeah. I love it. And that's what I'll say. About okay. Yes. Yeah. I promise you I'm seeing the questions come in <laughs> and, I want, and I'm going to get to them because they're, they're good, but I'm going to follow this thread uh, just a, a little bit longer because I think it's important because sitting on the stage where in your shadow, Demita Jo, <laughs> is, you know, a black woman who is integral right. to yes. the development of hip hop. Can you just describe a little bit about what that was like being a woman, you know, and even what was then, as you said earlier, pretty male dominated. Yes, it was at that particular time when I was dancing. Yes. Men were on the floor dancing their heart off. (laughs) And yet women are noted to make our husbands or our loved ones. We are beside them. We make them stand out. But this was a time where for me, I wanted a woman like me and my mother (laughs) and my family because they were educators and they were teachers and they always believed and they instilled in me that you can be somebody. All you have to do is just stand up and be it. And so therefore, when I watched the guys and I watched the, the ladies, how they stood back and let the guys take the floor, then I just went, no, that's not right. Women should be in there. And then if you even look into the 1990s, there are girls on the poles. They are, they, hey, yay, look at my body. Pump, pump, pump. You know, so I'm just saying that uh, hip hop to women is a growing thing. Mm-hmm. But now we're at a point, we have Queen Latifah. We have all these young people who are taking the rims in rapping. Mm -hmm. So they're not just letting the guys do their little thing. They are stepping up. Okay. Well, I want to talk a a little bit more uh, about women and also the treatment of women in yes. hip-hop culture, right? Because yes. we, we, I do think we have to talk about that a little yes. bit more. Rolling Stone right now is putting out this series of 
top 100 Mm -hmm. tracks in hip hop for different styles of hip hop. Mm -hmm. What they put as number one Mm -hmm. was ain't nothing but a G thing. Okay. Mm. According to the, the Rolling Stone editors, they say it changed everything. This is, this is what they wrote. They said it made it the default style for Los Angeles past and present. Mm. It brought street culture to the forefront permanently and forced every hip hop artist to decide whether they were gangsters or not. Mm. And it made Dr. Dre the undisputed king of West coast hip hop for generations to come. Okay. So then they say, the song also invokes some troubling responses. For folks who've seen the video, <laughs> there's some pretty difficult scenes uh, regarding m- male treatment of women. Mm-hmm. And also some of the, the actual lyrics mm-hmm. in the song. Mm-hmm. That wasn't the only one mm-hmm. in the 90s, obviously. Mm-hmm. It stands out because it was such a massive and important song. So mm-hmm. that's also part of hip-hop's mm-hmm. history and mm-hmm. legacy. Mm-hmm. And I wonder how you, you think through that. Well, definitely for me as a woman, I don't like that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I don't like to be called the B word a Mm. lot. Maybe it's because of my background. Maybe I was around so many strong women. I just can't see another woman tell another woman that you're B and then use it in, in a record or in a way to try to make it comfortable but I don't like the B word. I don't like the F word. I don't like all these words because you can still insult somebody or love somebody with other words. <laughs> but they don't choose to do that because we're now, to me, at a time we've got to shock everybody. <sighs> <laughs> uh, well... Misogyny is as American as apple pie. We all know this. Hip-hop is a reflection of American society. Mm -hmm. And given that misogyny is as American as apple pie, misogyny noir is as is as important or significant in the black community. And during the 90s, you know, Ain't Nothing But a G Thing was the song. It was the song. And Too Short has a catchphrase of which is his favorite word, is a B word. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and, um, and as a historian, again, I, I, I look at the ebbs and flows of how misogyny has been interwoven within hip hop, mm-hmm. but also how it's, how women, black women particularly who are rappers, have, have undermined certain tropes right. of yeah. the Jezebel trope and all of these caricatures of black womanhood and then have reclaimed it on their own terms. And again, I, I love Queen Latifah, especially the golden age of hip hop, because who you calling up, right? U N I T Y. Yes. <laughs> you know, and 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 one we would be remiss to not look at that as a response to her contemporaries Correct. who were calling black women beasts, mm-hmm. right? Um, but now um, the city girls are up, right? And they're calling each other the B word in an endearing way. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I'm no one to tell women what to say to one another, yes, but I am responsible <laughs> to tell men what they shouldn't tell women that they should be called. And, right. and, and I think, um, as communities become more educated about the impacts of words, especially to the LGBTQI community, when right. it comes to hip hop, right. that education has to happen. And if, if we're being honest on this panel, mm-hmm. we're seeing four of the five elements of hip-hop dominating the the genre but what we're missing is the knowledge knowledge. Mm -hmm. now that's true that's true knowledge is a key i I told these two we're gonna need hours (laughs) um just to get started actually so let me let me let me do uh justice and honor to some of the audience questions here tyree this one's for you because you're talking about revolution right Someone's asking, how does white flight and the New York City financial crisis of the 1970s come into the American story? Because the question is, is abandonment by capital and whiteness necessary for revolution? What? (laughs) It's the LAist audience, man, I'm telling you. You could tell. You could tell. Sheesh. Sheesh. I thought I'd throw you a softball. That was a softball. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, okay. So, um, 
<laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Feast. 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 Right. Um, so, can you uh, repeat that? Re- repeat, uh, paraphrase it, <laughs> just so I could like answer it forthrightly, because that was like a dissertation. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I think the point of the uh, that the the questioner is asking is though. is revolution comes right. by for certain sure. reasons, sure, and sure, one sure. of them is just the um, uh, the abandonment of, of community. Of course, of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah. So from a historical perspective, you, you have to look at New York. You can look at L.A. For the sake of this conversation, we're going to focus on L.A. Yep. The ways in which freeways have cut L.A. into certain quadrants, yeah. mm-hmm. particularly like the Sugar Hill area, mm-hmm. the West Adams District, for those who don't know it, Sugar Hill, yep. is a freeway that has cut a black neighborhood in half. Yes. But there's also been freeways that have been built to make sure that the black community doesn't leave South Central Correct. and come above the ten. Hello? Right, right. Not an accident, right? And you think about so the suburban elements of L.A., and you think about why Crenshaw or Compton, Compton especially, used to be an all-white town, mm-hmm. and where are all the white people now? Yes. Mm-hmm. And why is Compton seen as the most dangerous area in, in one of the most dangerous areas of the city? White flight. Mm-hmm. And when white flight occurs, so does divestment happen as exactly. well. Exactly, and when divestment happens, so does hyper-policing. And with hyper-policing comes police brutality and, mm-hmm. and, and the like. That divestment creates the music, the journalistic elements that we've been listening to for the last 20, 30 years. But to be honest, as a child of the hip-hop generation, the hip-hop generation will tell you, we don't need you to divest from our communities to hear our voices. That's right. <laughs> but America's issue, Los Angeles's issue, Harlem's issue is now pressing because gentrification is happening. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what mm-hmm. happens, the children of those who, whose parents fled through whiteness out of inner cities, and now their children are the new adopters of the genre. Yeah. Right. And they love black culture as much as black people love black culture. Mm-hmm. Now there has to be a new conversation about homage and appropriation. But hopefully... If investment occurs while that conversation is happening, then we can get back to the knowledge base that started the genre to begin with. The talk Mm. is not enough. Yeah, (laughs) for sure. That's true. Yes. Still is not. I actually, I want to meet that person who asked that question later, wherever you are. That was fine. By the way, that was an extemporaneous, like, dissertation. I was freestyling right now. That was really cool. When we come back, the final part of our special conversation in L.A. about West Coast hip-hop, including a surprise story from Demita Jo Freeman about an iconic movie moment. You've got to hear it. This is On Point. Master of Satire, David Sedaris, returns to the Soraya this November with a collection of new revelations guaranteed to make you laugh. Spend an afternoon with the best-selling author and humorist, Sunday, November 19th. This gab session with Sedaris is sure to open your mind, make you laugh, and keep you smiling in your seats. Single tickets are on sale now and going fast. Learn more at thesoraya.org. Hi, I'm Tracy Thomas, host of One for the Books, and we're back for another round. My guests this time are authors Attica Locke, Van Lathan Jr., and Jeff Yang. We'll be talking about how books become our favorite movies and TV shows. You can get their books and more at the pop-up from our partner bookseller, Octavia's Bookshelf. Join us on September 14th at the Crawford. Tickets are available at laist.com slash events. Welcome back to On Point. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. Now, the final part of our special conversation on the 50th anniversary of hip-hop. We gathered at the Crawford, LA's live events venue in Pasadena, California, along with a packed house of Angelinos passionate about West Coast hip-hop. As you've been hearing, they did not hesitate to energize the room with their call and response. So it was time to take their questions. One audience member wanted to know if hip-hop contributed to improved race relations today in comparison to 50 years ago when the culture first took root. Legendary dancer Demita Jo Freeman had an immediate response. Definitely. I always think that because, number one, hip-hop to me always gave more strength. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, I believe that hip-hop 
to everybody of my age, especially. <laughs> and I was, I'm only 36. <laughs> <laughs> You but don't even it, look as old as that. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> but anyway, the hip-hop era to me, period, is the growth. And today, in my opinion, it is changing. Uh-huh. And I don't know why it's changing because there's so many craziness is happening in the world today. Okay. But I was just seeing that the kids are pushing through. Mm. This one's for you, Tyree. This person wants to know, speak to the differences between female MCs like MC Light and Money Love versus Cardi B and Nicki Minaj. What happened to the consciousness spoken by the OG female MCs? Am I the one to ask this question? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I love that. That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> the agency of women in hip hop is a fascinating dissertation for anyone who wants to write it. I think that where the golden age of hip hop, where knowledge was prefaced Mm -hmm. and it was cool to be smarter than your other peers. I think now the Cardi B's of the world and the Meg Thee Stallions and um, are actually in intentional conversations with the OGs in in a lot better ways than the male counterparts are with the the younger OGs, the the, the, like following what I'm saying. And, And I actually see the OG women applauding the Cardi B's more than I see the OG men uh, applauding the 21 Savages. Uh-huh. How w- black women today, the Cardi B's, are using their sexuality as a, as a form of empowerment. I mean, MC Light will tell you that she felt as empowered as Cardi B does today when she was battling the men on the black or, mm-hmm. in, or in music videos. I don't, I, I think the expression of sexuality and the policing of black women's sexuality yes. is the real conversation. Yeah. And I'm not the, the one who's going to adjudicate that discussion. <laughs> but I will say that the impact is felt and the reach that Cardi B's, the Meg Thee Stallions, the Nicki Minaj's have today mm-hmm. is what the MC Lights and the Queen Latifah's dreamed that their music could one day tap into. Right. And I think there's an arc that both sides of that spectrum could appreciate. Okay. So- <laughs> Y'all not going to get me in trouble. <laughs> Hand for that. Yeah. That, was good. that was hard. <laughs> so um, I, I keep thinking of what you started with, Tyree, about revolution. Revolution, yeah. But 50 years later, the revolutionaries are in the establishment, Ooh. right? Ooh. Because they are the music business, right? I think Kendrick Lamar's winning of the Pulitzer is a moment where the establishment recognized mm-hmm. the critical importance mm-hmm. of hip hop as a high form of American expression. But we also have Dr. Dre has a yeah. at USC. Yeah, he's yeah. got he's he, the, the, he, the, the the young Ivine the Ivine Young Academy. Mm-hmm. But this is what we want, right? We want the stamp right. of success. Hmm. On the other hand, though, there's always the risk of a revolution losing its edge when it becomes part of the establishment. Do you worry about that? One hundred percent. Demita, can I, I, I ask really, you about really, that? It has a lot to do with uh, wanting this showbiz world. Mm. It's coming down to the money. Mm -hmm. That's what's turning, that's what I'm seeing today. It's changing. But you know, there's a conflict here Mm -hmm. because, yes, moving into the establishment, money, Mm -hmm. they can take the fire out of a revolution. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, black Americans have been so cut off from wealth building. So it's like, The success should not be penalized. You know what I mean? Of course, Mm -hmm. of course. When you look at the birth of hip hop as a response to Reaganomics Mm -hmm. and the war on drugs, you actually look at how the war on drugs sought to defang the black power movement. Mm -hmm. So actually, hip hop was supposed to be a counter response to Reagan's administration policies. Mm -hmm. But the problem was, is that the moment you give or dangle because this is the real key, mm-hmm. if you dangle a carrot in front of impoverished people and you try to force them to let go of their arms, whether it's a microphone or arms, and you tell them that if you follow the breadcrumbs, I will give you yeah. and your family access out of the projects. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. But you can forget about your homies on the block. That's right. Then you go back to the block, you flex on the block by wearing all the chains, and then it creates a level of jealousy. Mm -hmm. 
if we are look at it from a political lens that hip hop has been defamed from its political mm -hmm. aspects of knowledge, albeit that saddens me, I still have a confidence in black people to free and liberate themselves. And whether it's hip hop or whether it's jazz, mm -hmm. whether it's gospel music, whether it's spirituals, we will continue to innovate a new technology that yeah. will help us mm -hmm. get out of dire straits. Yeah. Sadly, Hip hop's corporatization undermines those strengths. Yes. yes. But I do fundamentally believe that there is something on the horizon that will assist in this upliftment. So I love. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> now that that's an informed optimism. <laughs> I read a I lot of books. <laughs> no, because I was thinking about another way of looking at perhaps the next 50 years of yeah. hip hop. And again, being at that transition point as a cultural force going, you know, from the neighborhoods to around the world. Mm -hmm. But then also we have a technological right. inflection point going exactly. on right now exactly. where basically anybody anyone mm -hmm. anybody with a computer and an idea right. can put out, you know, whether it's new dance, new, dance. new music, <laughs> but we have some perverse incentives going on too, oh, right? Mm -hmm. Like folks just putting out little ideas over TikTok <laughs> just to see what'll, what'll yes. catch, right? <laughs> I wonder if but what both of you think that technology might do because so much of this conversation, so much of the truth of the first 50 years of hip hop oh. is dependent on the lives and the stories of the people creating the art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if we have virality driving mm -hmm. where hip hop might go next, yeah. do you worry that it flattens the depth of it? Do you want to go be, first? No. Oh, you sure? Why not? Okay. No, no. Uh, no. No. Uh, you go first. You sure? You sure? Yeah, yeah, go. Okay. I was having a conversation with my uncle, Quasi Boyd Bolden. He is the one who introduced me to hip hop. He helped mm -hmm. me fall in love with the genre. And while we were prepping, I was talking to him as with excitement to talk to y'all. Mm -hmm. I was asking him, I was like, Unc, like, like where, <laughs> where is fifty? Where is hip hop going to be in the next fifty years?" Yeah. And he was telling me that social media is distracting mm -hmm. from innovation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hence the reason why billionaires are thinking they're innovators. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> because That's they right. think they're the new creatives. Yes. <laughs> when we all know that all innovation and creativity usually starts from the bottom, bottom up. up. <laughs> and rarely does it ever come from the top yeah. down. down. So when I'm thinking about hip-hop again, sadly, the artists are distracted with numbers and likes. Mm -hmm which distracts them from the knowledge that they need to politically arm themselves mm -hmm. to speak truth to power, which was hip hop's initial intention mm -hmm. to fundamentally change the social landscapes in which they inhabit yes. with that distraction and the virality element of TikTok, Instagram, la la la. We almost have to ask ourselves, do we need this technology to, to really get our word out? Yes. Is it for, if it, is it for, is it, is it self aggrandizing? I think t social media in particular is delaying that gratification yeah. from successful organization politically. And if, or it's not even a goal anymore. It's right. not, even, it's not yeah. even useful mm -mm. to the people who need it the most. Oh, right. okay. For their liberation. Yeah. I think it's useful individually. Right. Yeah. I, I, of course, that, I mean, I can, we can go, we could start a group right now. <laughs> 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 we could be the new De La Soul up here. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and, and we would go viral if everyone pulled out their phones at the same time, right? That's right. But what would that do to improve black and brown people's lives? Right. That's right. That's right. I mean, we're black and brown people, so you know we, we can get it popping. But we would be enfranchised. But what about our community? Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Right. Demita, do you want to add to that? I just wanted to add that the technology is taking away the artistry <laughs> of people. Well, you know, to to me an algorithmically driven development of an art form divorces the art form from the humanity, yes. mm -hmm. which makes it impactful, right? right. right? So um, I'm going to wrap up with one. I'm going to ask Demita to tell us one more story. Uh, and, and, then, and then we'll wrap up to absorb and honor the art that's going on outside. But first of all, I, I want to say that uh, Demita Joe has a book out. Hello. You should get it. Yeah. You should applaud it. Yeah. 
It's called. It's, there you go. There you go. Yep. It's called. Are you the girl from Soul Train? Yeah. <laughs> Can you believe that? This is my book. <laughs> Hello. Because people ask you that question a lot, I, I gather. Are you the girl from Soul Are Train? You the like, girl yes. Soul Train. I get that even <laughs> if, uh, if I wanted to call for gas. You know, the gas yeah. company. The lady be saying, uh, Demita, Joe. Are you that girl on Soul Train? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could go to Home Depot, and one guy would look at it, and then my mother would be saying, that man is looking at you. <laughs> and I'm going like, and then he comes up and he says, uh, I just want to know, are you the girl on Soul Train? <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I called it, so are you the girl on Soul Train? And uh, it's, I, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I'm going to read it cover to cover, because I'm sure it's full of juicy, the one, most amazing stories. Things. Now, I... I want to close with a story from you because I am. We are sitting on the stage with a true legend, <laughs> and Demita Joe's impact um, spreads far beyond yes. uh, the things that you might have known of seeing her do right yes. on on Soul Train. And I love this story. You just told it to <laughs> us backstage. I hope you don't mind. Okay. Because again, you're iconic in so many ways. <laughs> And this is one of the ways I did not know See? that you are iconic, okay? okay? And it has to do with the movie Airplane. Airplane. Right. It was a movie called Airplane <laughs> that everybody liked by David uh, Zucker and Jerry uh, Zucker. And I had the opportunity to come in and talk to them. And they wanted me to choreograph where it's a John Travolta uh, thing in, in, in the movie. And so anyway... I don't know why, but I just came in talking jab or talking to them, you know, using uh, crazy words. And one brother would look at me going like, what did she say? <laughs> <laughs> and so the other brother looked at Jerry and they said, why don't we put that in the, sh in the movie? <laughs> You know <laughs> and, the scene. Uh, uh, and, I, and she said, and they started creating in front of me, talking about, okay. No, uh, you were creating for them. Well, I've already given them the idea. <laughs> but anyway, she w the uh, one starts saying, yeah, we can have the stewardess, in a way, ask, you know, tea, coffee, or milk. And then sh she will be talking in a way, but we get a white lady, like a leave it to beaver lady or whatever <laughs> like that. And we can uh, have her interpret <laughs> what she just said to her. And I went, oh, that's a good. And then uh, 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 Jerry Zucker looked and said, that, uh, oh, you should play that part. <laughs> That would be great. And here I am so excited. <laughs> I've never been in the movie. Oh, my God. This is the first time. And, and then I got a call uh, at, at Paramount. And so I thought something really happened to my mother or something because I told her I was going to come. And the lady uh, secretary came in and said, uh, uh, Ms. Freeman, uh, we have a call for you real quick. And they said it's emergency. And I was going like... This was kind of weird. And, you know, I'm talking to them. And I said, hold that thought. I'll be right back. And I went and I answered on the phone. And that was Cher. <laughs> I was working, uh, was working at that time with Cher. But then I was, uh, I was free for a while. But one of the guys hurt his leg. So she said, get on the plane. Uh, to, uh, so I'll, we will meet you at the uh, airport in Las Vegas. And so, and I went, uh, 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 <laughs> I didn't know what to really say. So I finally had to go back. Because you were back. supposed to be in a movie. There you were supposed you go. to be in an airplane. In my first movie. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to explain to them that uh, I won't be able to do, what, what was I here for? Oh, for the John Travolta thing. And, then, and, he, and he said, yeah, next thing I know on an airplane, I saw this little scene that I'm doing. And I'm watching how people have really started, oh, they love that scene. The, with the lady, and, uh, and, and it was a black guy playing that part, and I was just going like, oh, my God. So I'm excited. She <laughs> is the creator of that scene. I made a mark. <laughs> Miss Freeman told us that back there, and I my jaw dropped. I was like, <laughs> that is the iconic scene from that movie. <laughs> you were the creator of that? Oh, my God. So I just I wanted to point that out because it's not directly related no. to the 50th right. anniversary of hip-hop, but 
you know, true greatness spreads in all different <laughs> ways. And I wanted to, rec- I wanted to recognize that. Um, <laughs> Demita Joe Freeman and Tyree Boyd Pates, this could not have been a better conversation. I'm privileged to be up here with you. Mm-hmm. Thank We're you privileged. so much. We're privileged. <laughs> Thank We're you so privileged. much. Let's give them a round of applause. Demita Jo Freeman is a groundbreaking dancer who began her career in 1973 on the legendary television show Soul Train. She helped popularize locking, one of hip-hop's signature dance styles. Her new memoir is titled, Are You That Girl from Soul Train? Tyree Boyd Pates is an historian of black culture and associate curator at the Autry Museum of the American West. They joined me for a special conversation about the influence of West Coast hip-hop in honor of hip-hop's 50th anniversary, an enormous cultural landmark. We were at the Crawford, LA's live events venue in Pasadena, California. Special thanks to LA's entire technical and events crew, including Rebecca Stummy and John Cohn. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. Thanks for listening. This is On Point. Support for Alleyist comes from the Emmy-nominated Apple original film, Still, a Michael J. Fox movie. It's been nominated for seven Emmy Awards, including Outstanding Documentary Film or Nonfiction Special. And it's now streaming on Apple TV+. Here's Academy Award-winning and Emmy-nominated director, Davis Guggenheim. I was looking for my next movie, and I, I, frankly, I was in a kind of a dark place. My kids were leaving the house because they're going off to college and moving out, and COVID was happening, and getting older and I was a little dark and uh, I read this interview with Michael in the New York Times and it made me smile. He was describing this terrible fall he had and uh, it was really horrible. He was stuck on the ground and his arm was broken and he couldn't reach the phone and he was all alone. But the way Michael told the story was beautifully written but also strangely funny. It made me laugh and I was like, wait a minute, that's interesting. Then I read more and I said, oh my God, he's a really good writer. The editing of this film is outstanding. That was Michael Hart. The editor, Michael Hart, is, who's um, just a genius and, and very much sort of a, a third leg on the stool in terms of the storytelling of this movie. Total Back to the Future nut and knows all of Michael's movies. Watched everything. Watched every episode of Family Ties. Watched every episode of Spin City. Everything. And started to show me scenes where... Because my brain went to reenactments and there's the movie is about half reenactment. In terms of retrospective, is half reenactment and half using Michael's films to tell a story. Like, there's a scene in the movie where Michael and Tracy are on a date and they kiss for the first time. You're watching the movie and you think this is when they're meeting. And the audience knows we're not tricking anybody. But Michael Hart deserves the credit for that. The way he did it, it was ingenious. What kind of a vibe were you going for? I wanted to ask this question. It was like, can you make a documentary that feels like an 80s movie? You know, and, cause I, I, and when I pitched it to Apple... I was like, I wanted to have big music. I wanted to have a big score. I wanted it to be funny. I didn't know that we would use footage this way. That's Michael Hart. But the instinct to do that, to actually make a documentary that's a wild ride, that was, that was the instinct. What was it like to work with Michael J. Fox on telling such a personal story? Michael was a total open book. He was like, whatever you want. And it's true. Like a lot of people say, oh, to ask me anything. But it really was ask me anything. And it really was nothing's off. And, and we, in, in our conversations, we went far afield. We talked about everything. The one thing he asked me was no violins, which I took to mean no pity. We don't want to make a film that's like about someone who has Parkinson's and we're going we're gonna to feel sorry for them. I didn't set out to make an optimistic film. That's not the case at all. We didn't pull any punches. And they wanted to capture the joy and the... And the, and the high highs and the low lows and, and, and take people for that wild ride. That's Davis Guggenheim, the Academy Award winning and Emmy nominated director of Still, a Michael J. Fox movie. It's now streaming on Apple TV Plus and it's rated R. You can find more information at fyc.appletvplus.com.